everybody. We want to welcome you this morning. We're so glad that you're here. We also want to say hello to people who are watching online and wherever you may uh, find yourself this morning. We want to encourage you to worship the Lord with us. He's the reason why we gather. We're here to lift high the name of Jesus. And if you're visiting with us today, welcome. The Lord bless you. Just a couple of things before we begin to follow uh, public health measures. We ask if you're going to be singing, if you're going to be, uh, if you're needing to uh, uh, use our facilities or make your way to the foyer, whatever, that you put your mask on. But if you're going to be seated and stationary, you can feel free to take your mask off and uh, breathe the air like the Lord intended. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning. Let's just open in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather. We pray, God, that the name of Jesus would be lifted high. Yes. Father, that we would decrease and that you would increase. Father, that we lay aside anything, any thoughts that are, that are uh, just permeating our minds. Maybe just cast those to the side. Keep our eyes focused on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Yes. We give you praise, glory, and honor. Pray a special touch on all of our lives today. And Father, for all that need a healing touch, let your power flow. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise let's uh, let's keep that uh, in our prayers, especially uh, as we head to the polls tomorrow, and uh, we need to be in prayer that God would have His way in our nation. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your family close by, why don't you grab a hug? And if you're close by somebody else, give a little elbow bump. The Lord bless you. for a moment. Let's just fill this place with the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah.
I love uh, I love that verse in the scripture where it says we will see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. Hallelujah. I believe that God is not done on planet earth yet. I believe he's going to pour out his spirit in even mightier ways. You believe that this morning? Amen. You believe that this morning? Thank you, Father.
yours forever. I am yours and yours forever. I am yours and yours forever. Let's sing that again. I am yours and yours forever. I am yours and yours forever. I am yours and yours forever. on you. 
Is that where my hope comes from? Does my hope come from the mountains? No. My hope comes from God, Amen. who made the mountains, yes. who created the universe. Our hope comes from Him. No other sources. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a great Savior. Amen. 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 You may be seated. And I invite you to watch some announcements this morning. Lord bless you. you. Just before we look to the word this morning, I'd like us to uh, take a moment and pray. Uh, Pauline is off to Sarnia tomorrow for knee surgery. And so we just want to pray that God would touch her, that God would be with the surgeons, and uh, that God would give her peace. So I'm just going to invite her family that's there to put their arms around her, and the rest of us will stretch our our arms in that direction, and let's just take a moment and pray. Our Father, we thank you for your great love. You are so concerned about every detail of our lives. And Lord, we lift Pauline to you. First, Lord, I pray for peace for her. God, that all anxiety and fear over this would be just cast to the side, and that she would embrace the peace of Christ. Father, we pray that your hand would be uh, with, the, with the hand of the surgeon. Lord, that the surgery would be a success. Even Lord, we'll ask that you would heal her knees so she doesn't need surgery. Lord, we believe that you can do that. So I just lift our dear sister to you. And bless her, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And uh, let's be in prayer that uh, tomorrow, throughout the day tomorrow, that uh, that the Lord would be with them. Well, I'm uh, I'm excited because today, as we announced, we're.
we're going to begin uh, looking through the book of Daniel. Uh, not the memoirs of Daniel Bennett, but the, the book of Daniel <laughs> as it's found in the Bible. All right. And uh, so what we're going to do today is I want to give you an introduction uh, to the overall study of the book. And it might surprise you to, to learn that we're not going to be in Daniel that much today. Um, but next, next week, we'll dive right into chapter 1. But for now, I want to introduce the book to you. And if you will, if you have your Bible with you, you can turn, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. And uh, passages will be up on the screens today, and we're going to be looking at a number of them. Now, you don't have to be a prophet uh, to realize that right now uh, the world is upside down. Uh, and if you really want to think about it, it has been in a, in a perpetual state of decline uh, since Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit and introduced sin into God's beautiful creation. And since that first sin of disobedience, people are born in sin. We need a savior. This world is, uh, you've heard this phrase, is sin sick. And according to Revelation chapter 21, God promises to make all things new and right. But right now there's a sense that the world is it's not just upside down, but it's broken. Uh, super viruses, climate alarmism, terrorism, government and business corruption, and all kinds of things seem to point toward to the fact that, uh, that our civilization is on a pathway to destruction. And how are we to make sense of such a world? Well, we look to the Word of God to find our answers, and there's big sections in the Word of God that is called prophecy. And for Christian people, we tend to focus on the particulars of prophecy. So many prophetic books have been written that say so many different things. It's interesting, I went uh, on indigo.ca, which is a, uh, a, a, a bookstore, in preparation from this message, and I typed the word prophecy in the search there, and it turned up 6,737 books. Now, although it's good to look into biblical prophecy, the best place to start is to look, I think, at the big picture of God's plan. Major prophecy, like what is printed in the Word of God, that's a thing of the past. We, there are people today that have the spiritual gift of prophecy and they speak their words of prophecy and their, their prophecies line up with what the scriptures say. But there's, there's no true prophet today that can stand up and proclaim the, the word of God with new scripture being written. I take that from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. So we don't see prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel walking around these days. God has chosen to communicate with his people differently ever since God sent his son to the world. In fact, in John chapter 1, uh, Jesus is called the Word. He is the Word of God. He brings God's message. Now, the words of the prophets that have been written down and preserved for us in the pages of our Bible, they remain. They remind us of God's uh, supreme rule over the affairs of, of all of humanity. Now, let's think about the prophet Daniel for a minute. We, we all remember the story of, of, the, of the lions. 
and the fiery furnace. But we should never forget that Daniel's life was really a record of not only what God was doing in the life of Daniel and his palace, but also of what God is going to do in the whole world. And to better understand Daniel and his prophecies as well as God's ultimate plan, I want us to look at a few general ideas regarding prophecy. And I want to share three thoughts with you. First of all, there is a huge interest in prophecy. People like to talk about the prophetic. It's a subject of, of talk of a lot of people. Many uh, well-known uh, TV evangelists became famous for their teaching on the end times. Sadly, with the differing views on end times prophecy, it's caused a lot of arguments and quarreling among the people of God. And I hope that as we go through Daniel, uh, that it will not cause any arguing or quarreling among you. You need to know that as your pastor, uh, I'm always right and I have all the answers. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> all right. Um, even, Lord, forgive me for that. He's the answer. He's the answer. Even among non-believers, there's an interest in the end of the world. There are so many movies about this. Every one of them got it wrong. So many books written. In fact, TV series have been produced and, and, and shows are viewed by, by millions of people. The last weekend was the 20th anniversary of September the 11th. We all remember, well, those of us who are old enough, Remember watching on the live news those planes flying into the buildings, and afterwards there were uh, there were psychics claiming to have predicted the fall of the World Trade Center. Come, they didn't say anything beforehand. Um, I had people after that ask me if if this was the start of the Great Tribulation. It's twenty years ago. People have an insatiable appetite for. Uh, things that are mysterious and, and they have an appetite for things that are prophetic. The second thought this morning is that there's a great imbalance in Christianity regarding prophecy. And I think you know this to be true. In just a, a, a couple of minutes, I'm going to show you a passage from Revelation chapter 1. And it's very easy to get caught up in sensationalism regarding prophecy and many people have said some very, very, very crazy things. And because of that, we have to be careful what we watch and what we read. Even when we read true prophecy in the Bible, it's easy to overemphasize prophecy to the neglect of the rest of the Word of God. So we have to be careful. Now, people who are imbalanced are those who uh, tend to set specific dates for the return of Christ and the second coming through their uh, know-it-all attitudes. I remember 1987, um, I, was a, I was a little kid, maybe around Nate's age, and a book came out titled 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come Back in 1988. Hello, this is uh, 2021. And we're still here. God didn't give us prophecy to tickle our curiosity. God wants us to learn. God wants us to examine prophecy. And it, it's, not, it's, it's not so that our curiosity will be piqued. It's not so that we'll have an edge over everybody else. You know, you know why prophecy is in the Bible? You know why God wants us to know about his great plan for the world and the end of all things? It's, it's for the purpose of pointing us towards godliness and to make us more like Jesus Christ. Now, Revelation 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and, and, and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. So, just for reading it, you're blessed. And you're blessed if you hear it. And you're further blessed if you heed it. If you read it, if you hear it, if you heed it. So there's blessing that comes from 
understanding these prophecies. And a third thought that I want to leave with you. There's two great books of prophecy in the Bible. The well, first one is obvious, the book of Revelation. No other book of the Bible spells out more of what God's plan for the world is than the book of Revelation. But in order to completely understand the message of the book of Revelation, we have to open uh, uh, and understand the second great book of prophetic scripture, and that's the one we're studying, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. And generally speaking, these two books lay out the broad blueprint of God's future plans for humanity. I want to show you an interesting passage in Matthew chapter 24. And in this chapter, Jesus makes a very uh, interesting statement. Matthew 24 and verse 15 says, So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Now there's a few things in that verse. First of all, Jesus mentions an event. The event is uh, called the abomination that causes desolation. If you read Matthew 24 in its context, it, uh, it ties in, it, it, it's, it's talking about signs of the end of the age. So that means that Matthew 24 ties in with end times events. So when Jesus mentions the abomination that causes desolation, he's talking about something that's going to take place in the future. Second thing from that verse is that Jesus mentions that this event is described in a prophecy written by Daniel. So Jesus is saying that in order to understand what that end time event means, we need to go to the book of Daniel. And then the third thing he mentions is let the reader understand. This event that is yet to come, it's described in the book of Daniel. It's important for those who are hearing Jesus speak. If you want a preview of coming attractions, you can write in your notes that Matthew 24 is uh, dealing with Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. It's a direct reference to the future world dictator who's going to rise to power. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here, folks. We, we are seeing a move towards globalism all around the world. The world is getting itself ready for the arrival of this ruler. So understanding the book of Daniel becomes important to us. And so the truth is, if we want to gain insight into God's program for the world, we need to see how the book of Daniel fits in with God's overall prophetic plan. And in the whole Bible, we see that God's plan for the world has been accomplished and will continue to be accomplished through six major things. Six major things, or you can write this down, six eras. I want to highlight those for you this morning. First of all, the law. Now, in the days of Adam and Eve, Noah and Abraham, the patriarchs, God often spoke directly to his people. However, when God met Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, he did something different. He, he codified all of the rules that, uh, that the people of Israel needed for holy living. And it became known as the law. And it started with the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And God continues to give the law right through to Exodus chapter 31. And beginning there, biblical history was marked by God's giving and communicating of the law. And with the written law, the people of Israel became a nation. They gained international prestige under the leadership of Joshua, David, and Solomon. Yet for all of God's blessings, the people rebelled and became unfaithful, and they broke the law continually. Civil war eventually took place, splitting the nation into two. Ten tribes, uh, in the north kept the name Israel. Two tribes in the south became the nation of Judah. And both nations continued to uh, reject God's law. In fact, they went, they went so far as to murder God's prophets and worship idols instead. And so as an act of discipline, God turns them over to foreign powers that drag the people of God from the promised land. 
You can read about it in history. 722 BC, Assyria defeated Israel. In 605 BC, the Babylonian army led by Nebuchadnezzar, they swept through Judah, they raided the temple, they took the precious uh, items in the temple back to Babylon to use them in their pagan ceremonies, and they took captives. And Jerusalem's destruction was completed 586 BC. And among the first exiles, the first captives to reach Babylon was a young man named Daniel. And Daniel became the model of how, how uh, the Jews were to live while they were in captivity, serving the Babylonian kings with integrity while remaining wholeheartedly devoted to God. All of this was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah. It'll be up on the screen here for you. I'll read it to you quickly. The Lord says, uh, you would not listen to me, says the Lord. You made me furious by worshiping idols you made with your own hands, bringing on yourselves all the disasters you now suffer. Now the Lord of Heaven's army says, because you've not listened to me, I will gather all the armies of the north under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, whom I have appointed as my deputy. But by the way, sometimes God uses ungodly rulers. I will bring them all against this land and its people and against the surrounding nations. I'll completely destroy you and make you an object of horror and contempt and ruin forever. I'll take away your happy singing and laughter. The joyful voices of bridegrooms and brides will no longer be heard. Your millstones will fall silent. The lights in your homes will go out. The entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And then after the 70 years of captivity are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins, says the Lord, and I will make the country of the Babylonians a wasteland forever. That's exactly what's described in Daniel chapter 1. Jeremiah predicted that this would happen. He gave it a 70-year time frame, and after 70 years, God promises that Babylon would be punished. Now, this next verse we know, Jeremiah 29, 10 and 11. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Many people claim that verse is their life verse, but the context is the nation of Israel who are going to go through 70 years of captivity, and when it's done, God's going to bring them back into the promised land and prosper them and give them hope. And history records it in detail. It's interesting when you study the prophecies of the Bible, when you see them predicted and how they come true, it just gives so much credence to the Word of God. Under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, the city walls of Jerusalem were re reconstructed. Worship was reestablished in the temple. The city was rebuilt. And Israel was a nation once again. The Old Testament closes with the prophet Malachi, warning the Jews not to repeat the mistakes that led to their destruction. And they listened to his words for a time. God's people ceased to worship idols. They held tightly to the law for a time. And with the close of Malachi, there was a period of 400 years without a fresh word from the Lord. The silence was shattered by John the Baptist, who was preparing the way for Jesus. He announced the coming of Jesus the Messiah, who lived and ministered under the law, perfectly fulfilling God's righteous demands. And through his death and resurrection, Jesus paid the price for the sins of all people, ushering in the age of grace. That's the first era. Second one, the next ones will go through quicker. <laughs> the church. All right? So the next era of God's program involves the church. This is the worldwide body of believers. And this unique time period covers both the past and the present. Even to Daniel, it was a mystery. But the church age brought a new way in which God would relate to his people. And Jesus pulled back the curtain, 
for his disciples when he announced this in Matthew 16, verse 18. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The actual birth of the church came after Jesus ascended into heaven, who seated at the right hand of God the Father. The disciples were gathered together on the day of Pentecost and all were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Now what distinguishes the church era from the era of the law? Well, the Jews were no longer the only people to receive the word of God. Also, the temple was no longer uh, needed because people became the temple of the Lord. Thank the Lord we're no longer bound to the rigid requirements of the law. We are under grace. And under the Lord Jesus Christ, both the Hebrews and the Gentiles were both part of the same body of believers if we place our faith in the Lord Jesus. And we're still in the church age in the year 2021. There's an unspecified time limit for the church age. Many wannabe prophets have come and gone with predictions of when the, the era of the church will end and when God's final plans for the world will begin. And all have been wrong and all will be wrong. Don't get caught up with those who set dates, please. Now, just before his ascension, Jesus was talking with the apostles they wanted to know when Jesus would restore the kingdom to Israel. Acts 1 verse 7, Jesus said, The times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority, and it's not for you to know when they will be. So, if any prophet says that they know the, the date of uh, Christ's return, you know it's hogwash because no one knows. You know that those people who do those things, they're part of what I call non-profit uh, organization <laughs> you're tracking with me that's good all right <laughs> we're to share the gospel without concerning ourselves with the dates why do we do that so that others be can become a part of the church through faith now so far we're all in agreement now I'm about to get into areas where people start to differ. Even people in Pentecostal circles, okay? So, my understanding of the word, the, net, the church age will end with the next event. You can write this in your outline, the rapture. The rapture of the church. According to a theologian and prophecy expert, John Walvert, is the next event on God's calendar. It's the beginning of God's future plans for the world, and though it hasn't happened yet, it could happen at any time. There's a Greek word, I, I meant to write it down, but when we get to the rapture part in Daniel, uh, I will explain that to you. But the word itself does not mean rapture. It literally, literally means snatch. The rapture is, is God's great snatch. And that's exactly uh, what's what's going to happen. He's going to snatch his people from the earth. You know, there's a lot of talk about when this event will take place, whether it's before the time of the judgments or in the middle of the time of the judgments or in the end of the judgments. There's some people who are, are what they call preterists, and they believe that, that uh, all of the great tribulation has already happened. And, and, and all the judgments have fallen and we're just in this period of, of waiting. But when you study the New Testament, uh, after the ascension of Jesus, the apostles preaching, they were anticipating that Christ's coming could happen at any moment. And there was no attitude that they were sitting there praying and waiting in anticipation for the wrath of God. They were waiting for the coming of the Lord. And we are in 2021 waiting. You have to remember when people say, well, how much longer is it going to go? The Bible says that for the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. For us, it's been a couple thousand years before the Lord has been a couple days. With an angelic victory shout and blaring trumpets, Jesus will descend from heaven to claim his own. God's word describes it best. 1 Thessalonians 4, 
16 and 17, there will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first, then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. And then verse 18 adds, so then encourage one another with these words. It's going to be an exciting day. In this world when godlessness and lawlessness are all around us and all hope seems lost, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, read those verses, and be encouraged by those words because someday Jesus is coming back. And when this event takes place, some amazing things happen. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 55, it says, In the twinkling of an eye, we will all be changed. Because these corrupt bodies are not made for the kingdom of God. We'll be given a brand new body that will never die. A brand new body that will never know pain or sickness or disease. It says that death is going to be swallowed up in victory. And we'll be able to shout the, 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 uh, the declaration of Hosea the prophet. Hosea 13 verse 4. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? And with this great event, we'll escape the terrible time that will come to earth. There's so many passages I could give you on this, but Revelation 3 verse 10. Since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. That was a message for the church. That Jesus spoke to the church in the seven letters to the seven churches. Now that terrible time that he mentioned is the next major era. Number four, the tribulation. For a period of seven years, those who rejected Jesus and are left on the earth will endure the fury of the great tribulation. Daniel 12 verse 1 calls it a time of distress. He says at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as uh, has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, uh, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. The Bible uh, paints a terrifying picture of what life will be like under the dominion of a world leader whom the Bible calls the Antichrist or the beast and his lieutenant, the false prophet. And they get their power and they get their authority from Satan deceiving and controlling the nations of the world. According to Daniel chapter 9, he said this dictator will confirm a covenant with Israel and the nations of the world for a period of seven years. Has that happened yet? No. That's a future event. It, it's essentially what every Jew longs for, peace with the nations of the earth. And this false peace will last for three and a half years. And after that time, the Antichrist will break his treaty and wage war against the nation of Israel. And you can read about that in Revelation 13. He will force the world to receive a mark either on their right hand or their forehead. Now listen closely. Unless you have the mark, uh, economic trade will be restricted for you. You won't be able to go to the store unless you have the mark. You won't be able to buy anything unless you have the mark. You won't be able to sell anything unless you have the mark. You won't be able to dine out unless you have the mark. With what's taking place in this world, folks, this, this time of the end is so near. He will restrict economic trade. And he will, uh, and he will cruelly persecute and kill anyone who either has refused to take the mark or who came to Christ during this time period. The Lord, however, will not allow evil to reign unchecked. He will pour out his wrath on the earth 
with a period of 21 judgments that will culminate in the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation period. A lot of people say that people, that Christian people are going to go through a good part of the tribulation as they experience the wrath of Satan before God pours out his wrath. I've read the book of Revelation, and so far as I know, God is in control of the seals and the bowls and the trumpets. And at the end of uh, the Battle of Armageddon is the end of the tribulation period. And the next major event in God's plan takes place, number five, the second coming of Christ. This will occur at the end of that, when all the armies of the world have assembled on the, the plain of Megiddo. Revelation 16, verse 16, Megiddo is the Hebrew name, English equivalent is Armageddon. I remember after 7 11, uh, 7 11, 9 11. Please forgive me, folks. I uh, didn't have any coffee this morning. I'm operating on no coffee. After 9 11 took place, my cousin called me and asked me, Is this Armageddon? No, it was not Armageddon. That took place in New York City. Battle of Armageddon takes place in Armageddon, Megiddo. Christ will return to the earth at that time as a mighty warrior. Revelation uh, 19, verse 11 and 12. He will have a mighty army with him. An army of angels and of saints. Revelation 19, 14. He will conquer his enemies. It's not really going to be a battle. When Jesus comes, it's going to be a slaughter. He will conquer his enemies. He will throw the Antichrist and the false prophet alive into the lake of fire. And at that point, Satan will be bound for a thousand years. Christ will commence to rule on the earth, which is the next major era. Uh, number six, the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom is a thousand year reign in which God will honor the promises that he made to David and his descendants. Those promises are recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Jesus himself, a descendant of David, will rule the earth in righteousness and peace. Folks, we'll finally uh, have in Christ, have the godly leader that we've been praying for. The surviving tribulation Christians, including a large remnant of Jews who have placed their faith in Jesus, will enter the kingdom and enjoy a long and happy life, along with the saints that were previously killed or were taken, raptured, according to Revelation 20, verse 4. However, life in this paradise does not guarantee sinless character. Not all who are born during this time will trust Jesus, and at the end of the thousand years, God releases Satan for a short season. He will deceive many people, the ultimate battle between good and evil will pit the forces of Satan against the people of God in Revelation 20. And just as they're about to attack, fire comes down from heaven and vanquishes them all. And the devil will finally be thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Now, from our perspective here in the church age, it's fairly easy to look back and, and understand what God was doing during the time of the law. And in the scriptures, we can see what will take place in the future. But what did Daniel see? Well, as we'll discover as we go through the book, uh, Daniel foresaw five significant events. He saw the rise and fall of several Gentile powers, the rebuilding of the, uh, the, rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem, the coming and the death of Jesus, the, the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. Those are all eras that we talked about, and it makes Daniel an important book to understand. And there's so much more that I can say, but I'm going to stop right there. I really truly believe with all of my heart that we're, we are awaiting that time when Jesus will come back for his church. And so we have to ask ourselves, am I ready? 
Am I sure that I would escape God's wrath? Are you ready? 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, it says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Jesus is going to appear. Are we ready? Everybody bow their head and close their eyes for just a moment. Maybe you're here, maybe you're watching online. You've not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you to do that right now in this moment. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Can you say that? Have you ever declared with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord? Have you repented of your sins? Have you asked God to forgive you? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that three days later that God raised him from the dead? Why not do that right now? ask God to forgive you right now. You say something like this, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that God raised him from the dead. And today I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Please forgive me and make me a brand new person. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you made that decision to follow Jesus today, I want you to get a hold of me, Pastor Jason, at hurontel.on.ca. And I want to encourage you in your first steps as a new believer. Man, with this great uh, doxology from Hebrews 13. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So a couple things before we before we close. Um, if you're able to, you can start bringing some candies to the church, and uh, we're going to do another drive-through thing like we did last year. And we want to uh, be able to put some candy bags together uh, to give out to children who would come through on October 31st. Uh, so please bring those to the church starting anytime. Also, we're need of workers because we want to get kids church rolling it's very easy there's very very little prep time involved and if you're interested in that um, uh, please come and talk to me and uh, stay for some refreshments outside the Lord bless you thank you for being here